Let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for another beautiful day that you've given us. And we feel uh, summer slipping away and fall coming in with weather like this. Lord, it's wonderful to be here together as a church. And for those that are watching online, Lord, we are worshiping together. And we thank you for that privilege that we have. And so, Lord, I just pray that as we share a couple of songs uh, together and as Kevin brings the message, that you would speak to our hearts. Encourage us, Lord, and uh, build us up so that as we go into this new week, that you would be able to use us for your glory. And we'll just ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to go through some announcements, folks. Uh, I want to remind you about the, the boxes here. Uh, there's supplies that you can use and talk to Andrea about that. Also, if you just want to donate to send those boxes, it's $9. So if you'd like to uh, put something in the offering, just put a note on there for Harriet so she knows it goes towards the uh, shoe box. Okay. Um, remember Keith Collins. Uh, he has tested positive for COVID. And we just want to lift him up in our prayers every day. Um, just to, that he has comfort and uh, with the staff, they're really overwhelmed, I think, right now. And, and just to uh, the families that are unable to go in and be with their, their family. Uh, so just, just pray for that whole situation. Uh, Davy Daniels, I understand he's home and he's doing pretty well. So but let's continue to pray for Davy. We have Karen with us today. So Karen, we're glad that you're with us. And nice food. So, um, but we're we're glad for them, and just be with that family too as they go through this process. Uh, are there any praises, anything that has blessed you uh, this week that you want to share? Anyone? Well, I just pray for people that drop in, and it's just wonderful when somebody comes to the door to visit. Okay. You, you enjoy those visits. Yeah. Yeah. And pray for Donna. She has a stress fracture in her left foot and it's on a, uh, a boot. Okay. She's going to have her right knee done. Repaired, her right knee her, get, get, replaced. Get. Okay. So Donna has a stress, stress fracture in her left foot. So pray for that. And then she's getting ready to have her right knee replaced. So pray for Donna. Anybody else? I just want to say thank you to the many cards and notes that I've gotten from not just church people, but from the community okay. that are uh, praying for me, and uh, I'm amazed. And yeah, I'm so good. thankful for right. the thoughtfulness of people. Sorry. <laughs> okay, but yeah, Shirley, thank you for that. And... Uh, They'll have services for your sister in two weeks, right? And first of October. Anybody else? Dave yes. And Missy and Peggy and I went out and visited with Benita the other day, and it was supposed to be therapy for her, but I think it turned out to be more therapy for us than it was for her. Well, good. It was good to sit and visit with her, and and she's just a real encouragement to us. Good. Thank you, Roger. And we need to do that, don't we? Just get out there and and. Uh, you know, stay safe and visit and let people know that you're thinking about them. Uh, that's always a positive. Anybody else? Uh, I want to remember this, I think it's this Saturday that Franklin Graham was having a big prayer thing in Washington, D.C. for okay. our country. Yeah, the thing in Washington, D.C. from Franklin Graham praying for our country. We all need to do that every day. Uh, during this difficult time. I have a praise. We had our uh, search committee meeting last Monday night, and I just left there very encouraged. We had a wonderful meeting, and we shared a lot uh, just from our hearts, and it was encouraging. Uh, we started working through resumes that we have and uh, started to weed through those, and so we'll meet again the 1st of October. But we appreciate your prayers. And uh, we truly want to uh, listen to God as he directs us on searching for a new shepherd for this church. So um, 
Okay, that's good that we have things we can share and praise the Lord for. You want to mention the hand sanitizer? Oh, yeah, thank you, Harriet. If you notice right here, this little box, and there's one by the door, uh, there's one inside as you go into the copy room area, there's one by the bathrooms. Correct? Well, it's, it's on this wall. On uh, this side. As you come out. Mm -hmm. And then as you go upstairs, there's some up there. These are all hand sanitizers. They're automatic. You just stick your hand under and drop a dime in the box. <laughs> <laughs> you just stick your hand under there. It'll lay a little bit in there so you can sanitize. So we're uh, trying to keep everything updated instead of just the squirt bottles everywhere. And so just feel free to use those as you come in or as you leave. And they're all placed about the same level as you see. You'll see a little red light flashing, and that just means everything's okay. It's, uh, they're all automatic. So appreciate having those available for us. Anything else? Okay. I'm just thankful my sister's been with me for the past week and I'll be another week. Yeah. She was there on Friday morning whenever I was over at the hospital and I all I could worry about in that ditch was who's gonna take care of John? What am I gonna do? My greatest nightmare. Yeah. Scared me to death. I yeah. didn't I didn't care about myself, I just worried about him. Yeah. And he's he's doing well. He's got good care, doesn't he? Yep, so far That's good. good. <laughs> yeah. Praise the Lord for that. Well, let's celebrate with some music today, and uh, this one you know, because you're alive, I live.
is easy for him to share. And Lord, keep, keep our hearts open as we hear the message today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So we're going to continue in Galatians this morning. Um, if you haven't here, I'm giving the really short spiel. I'm from Texas, moved up here last August. There we go. That's a really short spiel if you haven't been here. Uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, right now my mother-in-law's in town. She's an interior designer. And whenever that happens, my wife gets all excited and does a lot of projects, okay? So this time I was prepared for it. I said, honey, I will take off a day during the week and I will stay home. And I will do whatever needs to be done, okay? hanging light fixtures, I was sanding a table, I was doing a table, and it's times like that, like, being very careful, because I know they're watching online, I had to phrase this, but you feel like a slave to the time limit that you have, because you don't have this massive amount of time, you don't have a time where you just go, okay, for the next two weeks I'm going to do this, it's like, I've got a day, and then I might have a little bit more time the next day, but I have to get this finished, or else it's Let's be honest, me and my wife were joking. One of the fixtures took me about three hours to get in because a piece was funky, okay? And we were laughing about it because, yeah, it was awful because my wife's sitting there holding this fixture, okay, like this, while I'm sitting there wiring it in, then realizing we have to take it back out, rewire it, then put it back up, rewire it, all that fun stuff. It took about two hours, but we both knew if it got up there and it wasn't right, it might stay there for two weeks before we finally get back in a circle around. So you, so you kind of felt like a slave to time, okay? wasn't a slave to anybody, but just the time limit you had. And kind of bouncing this into the passage, what we're going to be looking at is what Paul calls and talks about slavery to legalism, okay? So we're going to be in Galatians 4, 21 through 5, 6. And while y'all are turning out the... The, anti, the antibacterial made me think of a funny story I had with that. So right whenever COVID began, you knew it was hard to find it. And so we were in Texas, we had gone to visit, and everything was really crazy up here. And in Texas, it was like, this doesn't exist. It was weird, okay? And so we walked into a Walgreens, which this is the first time that my mother-in-law knows that I was at Walgreens while I was at her house. Uh, anyways, and... I'm sorry, if you're at Walgreens, it's almost like you're trying to get it. Okay, it was weird. My dad's like, I want to buy you some soap. And I'm like, why do we need soap? I'll take soap. Okay. And so we go in there, and there's this antibacterial bottle. I'm like, yeah, I'll get some. You know what? So I press it. Okay. Now, this put a glob in my hand. This wasn't like a little, like, you do just to rub in your hands. Guys, I was rubbing it up to my shoulder. Okay, just trying to get it. That was just for fun, Okay. But I feel like you could have taken a bath in that stuff that day because it just, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, how do I do this? Okay. Anyway, so Galatians 4, 21 uh, through 5, 6. We're going to read this. Uh, Tell me who you want to be under the law. Don't you hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons. One by a slave and the other by a free woman. But the one by the slave was born as a result of the flesh, while the one by the free woman was born through promise. These things are being taken figuratively. For the women represent two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai and bears children into slavery. This is Hagar. Now Hagar represents Mount Sinai and Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, childless woman, unable to give birth. Burst into song and shout, You who are not in labor for the children of the desolate woman will be many, more numerous than those of the woman who has a husband. Now you two, brothers and sisters like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as then the child born as a result of the flesh persecuted the one born as a result of the Spirit, so also now. But what does the Scripture say? Drive out the slave and her son, for the son of the slave will never be a co-heir with the son of the free woman. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of a slave, but of the free woman. For freedom Christ set us free. 
<coughs> Stand firm then and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. <coughs> Take note, I, Paul, am telling you that if you get yourself circumcised, Christ will not benefit you at all. Again, I testify to every man who gets himself circumcised that he is obligated to the entire law. You who are trying to be justified by the law are alienated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. For we eagerly wait through the Spirit by faith the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is faith working through love. Let's pray. God, as we unravel this today, God, as we look at this, Turning our hearts to you right now, turning our hearts to your word, I pray that you would just enlighten us to areas in our life where we're trying to be legalistic, where we're le living by a legalist standard that's anti-gospel, Father. And Lord, I pray that today, God, that you would just help all of us focus on grace, focus on living by that, not trying to add to what you have already accomplished on the cross, God. I pray all this in your name. Amen. Alright, so looking at this scripture, it can get confusing, okay? Um, because it kind of bounces back and forth. So I have three points, which I do every week because I've got to keep it around 20, 30 minutes, okay? Uh, for, for COVID standards. But normally what I'm going to do is I'll go with the points, but I'm going to kind of go with the point right now, and then we're going to break this section down, okay? So point number one, there are two types of lives that people live in the church, okay? There's the legalism, okay? Legalism, I define it, this is not, <laughs> this is my definition, okay? Doing nice or good things that build yourself up, okay? It's not about Christ, it's more about you, okay? I remember when I first got to IBSA, it's, you have to understand, it's strange coming out of living a church work life, okay? Because every Sunday you were doing certain things, and now, on Sundays, I could be at different churches preaching. So there's a thing you have to grasp and understand that you're preaching the gospel for Jesus Christ. You're not preaching for yourself and bouncing around different churches just to be known. And you have to grapple with that. And so kind of putting that in a legalistic side, sometimes you get excited. You say, oh, I'm preaching. And it's like a building yourself up, and you have to sit there and go, no, no, Jesus, this is your glory. Nothing that I do is worthy of anything. And you have to get into that mindset, no, that is truth, and get rid of the idea of, oh, I'm preaching different places. Ooh, you have to grasp that. And so legalism is where you're doing nice things, but you're trying to push yourself up. Okay, It is literally saying Jesus Christ's death on the cross was not enough. Therefore, I am going to add to. I am going to do more things to help earn or merit my salvation. None of us in this room think, oh, I can earn salvation. But yet a legalistic mindset says, I can. One of the more interesting things I have learned as I, as I continue to get older, and I'm only 35, guys. I feel like when I get really old, I'm going, wow, I am wise. And I'm going to look back at this and go, yeah, I was 35 and stupid. Uh, but anyways, one of the things I've learned, like, through doing quiet times, my quiet time used to be super drawn out, super long, and now I've kind of streamlined it, made it more focused. And on Sundays, I don't have a quiet time. And then everybody's going, in Texas, they would have gasped, okay? Because it's like, oh my gosh, you don't? Like, no, why am I doing something that's just for myself to go, I did it? Because on Sunday mornings, that's how I would feel because I'm going to listen to a sermon. I'm going to be applying that. I'm going to be studying this, my scripture, my text. I'm going to be applying this to my life. So why am I adding something else? It was just making me exhausted. It was making me more tired, and it wasn't letting me enjoy Jesus on his day. I was doing it out of a legalistic mindset, not because I was like, oh, man, i got to have my quiet time. It was what? I'm going to have my quiet time so I feel good going to church. That was not what needed to be happening. So I've kind of adopted this new mindset, and I love it because I get to enjoy Jesus not thinking about, oh, what did I do this morning? Was it great this morning? Did I pray enough this morning? 
Like I was praying for people this morning, different pastors that I know. That's what I was doing this morning as I was getting ready to preach. That's what I, I wanted to do. That's what Jesus wanted me to do. It did not exhaust me. It did not sit there and make me go, oh, I feel great that I did this. It was about Jesus. And that's the thing that legalism overlooks. It makes it about you. And that's what legalism will always do. And then there's this other side, the second side, which is grace, okay? And I've, I've titled this, Living for Jesus Daily, Not Worried About How You Look. Most of the time, legalistic people worry about what they look like to the outside world. They worry about if their family doesn't look amazing. They worry about if they don't look amazing. They worry about little bitty things that really honestly should not matter. A, a person that looks like Grace, they do not care. They're very honest about themselves, and they don't care what they look like to the outside world. Now, we're going to get into some more, because the thing is, what this sounds like is legalism sounds like, oh, well, you're living against sin. And grace sounds like, oh, you're doing what you want. Okay, and we're going to break into that in a minute, because that is not at all what it says. But basically, very small definition, legalism, slave to the law. Grace frees you from the law. Okay? And that's what we're going to break down. But we're going to start in 21. I'm going to break this down. Okay? Tell me, you who want to be under the law, don't you hear the law? Okay? So the law is literally the books of Moses. If you look into those, they are going to show you that you cannot be free. Okay? You cannot sit there and keep all of the law. He says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave, the other by a free woman. But the one by the slave was born as a result of the flesh, while the one by the free woman was born through a promise. So, if we remember the story of Abraham, Abraham is sitting there, and he has gotten this promise from God. His wife hears the promise from God and says, let me help, let me fix this. This is not saying that all women do this, okay? This is saying that all people do this, okay? So guys, don't look at your wife and go, see, I shouldn't listen to you. This is people. We normally sit there and go, okay, I hear God saying something, so I'm going to do X to make this happen. That's what his wife did. She said, okay, I'm not having a kid. We have a slave. You sleep with her. You have a child. That way we keep the promise. God was not working like this. God was never going to work like this. But that is what happened. She was born as a slave. She had a son that was born as a slave. Then Sarah had another son, okay, who was born through the promise. Now, we all remember, she was in her 90s, okay? She had a son. This was out of nowhere. This should not have happened. This was the son born of the promise. This was Isaac, okay? And he's sitting there comparing the two. He's saying one who represents that Mosaic covenant, the covenant of the law, the other represents Jesus, okay? So follow that. Now, if you remember... Jesus comes out of that lineage. That's why he's saying this. So there's a two-fold parallel going on here. Okay, in verse 25, now Hagar represents Mount Sinai and Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem. She is in slavery with her children. Okay, so you've got the children, you've got the Jewish people in slavery to the law. Okay, now I look at that and I go, okay, how do we transition that and go, what does this look like in the church? Because the thing is, I can talk about the law and all these things, but what does it look like to us? Because we are not worried about sacrificing goats. We are not worried about any of those things in the church. Right? Okay, you don't have a sacrifice letter. We're good. That doesn't happen on Sunday nights, okay? But the thing is, a lot of times what we do is we will sit there and add things to it. Okay? We go, Jesus is enough, but you can't dance, okay? I'm picking on Baptists because we've, we've had that rule forever, and some people grumbled that I joked about it, but yeah, we add something to it, okay? This is going to be crazy. We go, man, Jesus is enough, but if you look at alcohol, you're a sinner, and you're going to hell, and we say things like this, and we're adding to the gospel, Okay? If we add things to the gospel, it is anti-gospel. That's what it is. It is against Jesus. 
So the thing is, we sit there and we'll say one thing. We'll say, we're going to live by grace. But we're going to add rules to this grace and we turn it into legalism. It's a legalistic thing. Guys, when we look at Scripture, that is our guide. Not a person. Not anything else. Scripture has to be it. If it is not in Scripture, you can't sit there and make a definite idea about it. You can't sit there and go, oh, that is evil because it's not in Scripture. And I've said it's evil. That's what we do. I know at the office one time, a guy was joking with me. He said, yeah, that old Baptist saying, uh, don't drink or chew or date girls that do. And I almost lost it because I had never heard that say that. That is hilarious. I was like, but the funny part is, like even with joking about it, yeah, we start adding things to people. We start adding things that are just like, that, that honestly we, we will sit there. I remember sitting in seminary. And I'm going to go back to drinking for a minute because the, the president of the seminary was trying to explain to us how wine back then was not wine today. And I was like, but didn't we learn to make it from them? Okay, and I'm, I was kind of confused on this because they were trying to parse this word that was not there. They were trying to say, oh, well, this means it didn't have any sparkle in it or something like that. And I was like, what is sparkle? Like, is that the alcohol that's in the wine? So they, they got grapes, they crushed them up, they fermented it, but they didn't have that. So it was just kind of funny because we start adding stuff to people thinking, hey, we live by grace here, live like this, and we are literally like the Pharisees because that's what they did. If you remember, in the New Testament, they're sitting there getting mad at the disciples because they did not wash their hands. And Jesus looks at him and says, look in your heart. That's what's unclean. Because everything else you eat, it passes through your system, it's gone. But what's in here matters. And we have to watch out for legalism because it kills people. It gives them expectations they could never meet and tells them if you don't meet these, you are not worthy. And Jesus says, Come, you are worthy, because I can make you worthy. Now, breaking this down even further, okay? I am not saying, if you look all through Romans, I am not saying, live whatever life you want. That's fine, grace covers it. Paul literally says, by no means. He says, do not live that way. Grace should not abound because you want it to, because you want to live your own life or do whatever you want to do. He literally, and going back to this whole thing, when I say living for Jesus, that means living by the Word. Okay? If the Word says, don't gossip, we don't gossip. That's what it says. If the Word says, do not be sexually immoral, then we, do, we shouldn't be sexually immoral. But we are going to add something to it to say, oh, okay, well, if you even kiss before you're married, then you're sexually immoral, therefore you are a sinner. Like, that doesn't say that in Scripture. Like, I think about, we watched a documentary recently about this, and I didn't even know about the book, which is kind of funny, uh, but uh, Say Goodbye to Dating was the name of the book, okay? All right? And they kind of walked through this with this author who wrote the book. And basically, he was telling people, like, you shouldn't even kiss before marriage. He was adding something to it. Now, what he did with that, he said, if you follow these rules, you are going to have an amazing marriage. Okay? Now, the funny part about that is if you keep breaking that down, that is a complete prosperity gospel mentality. If you keep these rules, you'll be blessed. If you buy this, you'll be blessed. If you do this, you'll be blessed. If you pay me $3,000, you will get a million dollars one day. And you will be blessed. That falls in the same thing. It is anti-gospel. Grace never says that. Jesus Christ says, come to me. Come to me. Accept my free gift and live it out. That's it. There is no further definition of it. 
he goes on to sit there and he starts talking about the childless woman, rejoice, childless woman, and able to give birth, burst into song and shout, you who are not in labor for the children of the death of the woman will be many more numerous than those of the woman who has a husband. This is literally sitting there talking about this promise. Because in the second part, I want you to think, grace and legalism do not get along. They never will. It literally says that in verse 28. Now, you too, brothers and sisters, like Isaac and children of the promise, but just as then the child born as a result of the flesh persecuted the one born as a result of the Spirit, so also now. When grace and legalism get in a room, they don't get along. Because legalism wants more and grace wants to live out faith. So they sit there and they bicker and they argue and they sit there and say, well, you don't do this. I remember one of the funnier times uh, in youth ministry, we had a, a very um, charismatic church in the area and they, were, they weren't teaching... They were kind of just trying to get kids whipped up into emotion. That was it. Okay? They would sing songs for like two hours, and the pastor would get up, and he would just kind of give this cheerleader sermon. Okay? And that's what I kind of call it. And because I actually wanted to make sure I was right on this, I had him come preach at our youth group. So I watched what happened. And the thing was, there, I gave him a text and said, preach from this text. And so what we did was I taught on two verses, he taught on five verses, another guy taught on three verses. Okay? And I just wanted to see, like, is he a text-focused guy or what's going to happen? Man, we went all over the place. It was not on the text. It was bounce around. You are not, not uh, going to be bullied. You are not this. And I'm just like, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Like, we're not even there. But the thing was, he would whip kids up into emotion and get them excited. And I was like... There's nothing wrong with being excited about Jesus, but getting excited just because you sang a song 6,000 times is not anything focused on Jesus. And so one night I was teaching on worship, okay? And I, and I break into this part talking about there was this one song that I kind of used as a thing, as an idea, and it said this one lyric, I think I counted it, and it was like 97 times. Okay, and it, The lyric was literally, come away with me, come away with me, this will be fun. And that was supposed to be a worship song. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, I ain't sing that to anybody. It really, it really did not matter. And so I'm teaching on this, trying to show them, look, songs are supposed to promote good theology. And so I was bringing them back to song, and we were looking through song. And I had this one lady who got really frustrated at me, okay? And, and she was one of my helpers with youth, and she came, she wrote me an email, okay? And when you get an email, sometimes it's not the best. You're like, oh, okay. This will be fun. I have a meeting about this one. Um, and what she grasped from what I was teaching was there should be no repetition in songs. I'm like, where? What? Who were you listening to? I was like, because I never said this. And literally at the end of the song, it said tradition. There will be a lot of traditionalists burning in hell. And I'm like, woo! That's that one's good. And so literally, she was telling me as being a, a conservative, theologically minded guy that I would be burning in hell for this because I had taught against emotional, only trying to manipulate emotions and not trying to focus on Jesus. And so we had a long talk after that, okay? And she actually understood what I was saying, and she was like, man, I, I must not have paid attention to you. I was like, you probably didn't. Because I literally pulled out my notes and said, here, this is what we taught on. I was like, and she was, she realized what she had done was there were a few kids in our group that really liked this emotional idea of Jesus, but they were living very sinful lives, um, and and they weren't they were just kind of wanting to feel better about themselves by singing these songs over and over and over again, rather than actually living by grace and living out my faith. And she was listening to them and wasn't listening to what I was saying. And so the thing was, guys, a lot of times we will sit there and we will live under a slave of something like legalism and we sit there and we try to look great, but we're not. And whenever legalism and grace get in a room, they're going to clash. There's no room for legalism and grace because it is anti-gospel. Legalism doesn't work in that mixture. And so the thing is, whenever we look into this, we have to understand that 
this whole story about Abraham, Sarah, you have to remember that verse where it says, burst into song and shout, you who are not in labor. Um, guys, when Abraham got his promise, it was Abraham. And God's telling him, hey, you are going to have descendants as multiple as the sands on the seashore. <clears throat> Could you imagine someone telling you that? You have no kids. The first time he got the promise, I believe he was in the 60s. No kids. And you're sitting there staring out kind of the wilderness. This is kind of what I'm picturing. It's like a wilderness. Abraham's standing there. God's telling him this. I, I don't know how my faith would feel during that time. Like, Man, he better get to work. Like, this is, like, I, I am getting older. <laughs> like, we better have some movement on this soon. And that's where Hagar comes into the story. But the thing is, God keeps his promise to her by bringing him Isaac. And that's what we have is this, the, it says, therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of a slave, but of a free woman. Okay? We are children of the promise of God. We can trace our lineage back to that promise. Okay? Not that we came from Abraham, but we came from that promise because he says, I will bless all nations through you, through your descendants. We trace it back to that. And then he goes on in section five, okay? And this is point three. Freedom was given to us, but we can go back to slavery, okay? He literally says, for freedom Christ set us free. Stand firm then and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery, okay? So we were slaves. Christ sets us free, and we can start throwing burdens on ourselves that are not supposed to be there. He goes, verse two, take note. I, Paul, am telling you that if you get yourself circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you at all. Okay? So this was saying somebody that was not circumcised was now going to go under the law. Okay? That is what that is talking about. They were previously not, and now they're going to go through and go, okay, now I need to be this way. Because that grace, that gift of grace, that blood of Christ was not enough. I have to submit myself to this other thing. Okay? And he keeps going, and I testify to you, every man who gets himself circumcised, that he is obligated to do the entire law. He's saying, look, if you want to sit there and go this far, if you want to listen to these false teachers that have come in your midst and said, you have to do this, well, remember, you have to keep it all. You have to keep the whole law. This is not partial law. You have to keep the whole thing. Then he goes, you who are trying to be justified by the law are alienated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. So you have taken Christ's promises that this is enough, and then you have said, no, 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 this is not enough. Jesus, you are not enough. I need more. I need to merit my own salvation. I need to look completely different. He says, you have fallen from grace. That is a scary thought. To th think you, you, that someone has fallen from grace and what this is saying, you have literally said no to grace. Because you think you need more. And it's funny to think like this. Like I love it whenever my kids will tell me something and then I explain it out to them, kind of what they're saying. And we've all done that to our kids and the kids kind of look at you like, eh, hey, you got me there. <laughs> like it does sound dumb. It's like Paul saying... You thought Christ was enough. You knew Christ was enough. But now you're thinking, you, a finite mind, compared to an infinite God, are saying that you need more than what I've already told you you needed. It's kind of one of those kid moments. Oh, you got me. <laughs> it does sound stupid when I hear it like that. <coughs> he says, for we are eagerly awaiting through the Spirit by faith, the hope of righteousness. When we sin, it does bother us. None of us go, oh, I sinned. Good job. I, I did it. I'm okay. <laughs> None of us feel like that. It bothers us. It bothers us to the core. It makes us go, man, why am I still living a sinful life? And we're staring at our flesh while we're saying that. We're saying, why do we still sin? But Christ is saying, look, grace is enough. 
And look, you are eagerly awaiting this time. There will be a day when you are righteous. When you die, you will be glorified. You won't have to live like that anymore. You won't have to have the guilt of sin. But the thing is, because of legalism, okay, legalism makes you feel good. Because it, you keep certain things, but you don't pay attention to other things. You keep certain rules, and it goes, oh man, I feel good. It's like my, my quiet time on a Sunday. Oh man, I felt great about myself because I had a quiet time on Sunday. Even though I wasn't paying that much attention during sermons a lot of times because I was tired. <laughs> so why was I feeling good about what I said as a law? Because it made me feel good. Legalism can make you feel good, but the thing is, God never literally sits there and says someone in the Bible, you should feel good about yourself all the time. It's not in Scripture. <laughs> but he says, by the Spirit, we are eagerly waiting for the hope of righteousness. As I memorized Galatians 5 and ESV, so if you see me quote it wrong, it's not going to match sometimes up here. So if you see that, that's why I switch Bibles and how I, uh, what I preach on up. So sometimes it's going to say weird things. But that's what it says. We're eagerly awaiting the hope of righteousness. How many of you want to never sin again? All of us do. It's not going to happen on this earth. We do yearn for that day. And he goes on, verse 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is faith working through love. When he's saying that, he's saying, your life should be looking different because of your faith. Your faith lives out and makes you look different. Okay, next week we're going to be getting into the fruit of the Spirit. And this, he's going to show us what it should start looking like. He's also going to say some really mean things about the false teachers. Okay, that's kind of the fun part. But the thing is, our lives should start turning. I remember there was this one lady that I, I worked with that was kind of funny. And I had never really thought of this. Okay, just so you know, I love seminary. But it does not prepare you for ministry. Your ministry prepares you for ministry. There are so many things that I was not prepared for. And by God's grace, he gave me the preparation I needed. But I remember sitting there teaching. And this is a youth Bible study. So you have to understand, I've got like 7th graders, 8th graders, ninth graders, and a few 12th graders in this room. And this lady who has come in, who has come to Christ, okay, who used to be a prostitute and would prostitute herself for drugs like probably five years before this, okay, and she's helping, and we start talking, and she goes, man, for four years, I didn't even know drugs were a, were a bad deal. I'm like, okay, so me, a seminary student, okay, is like, what are we about to get into here, okay? And she literally goes on to explain, my life was such a wreck before I met Christ. It took Christ time to clean it. And then she was like, I completely think they're terrible now. But at that immediate time, I didn't know scripture. And I didn't know what I should live like. But living by scripture changed her. Her life was completely transformed. No, no more was she a, a prostitute for getting drugs. God had changed her into a, actually a vibrant member of the church that was living out her faith and wanted to encourage students so that they did not go down the same path that she went down. That's what he means when he says, what matters is faith working through love. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you this morning. God, thank you for using me just an unclean vessel, God. But I pray that you would just Help us to take everything that we're grasping here right now, this, this thought of legalism. God, help us to drive that away from us. But God, also I pray that you would help us every day to live out by grace. I pray that you would literally let us know that what matters is faith working through love. God, I pray that you would just bless us the rest of the week, God. Help us think about it every day. You're now praying. Amen.